my name is Eddie. So we, we are going to talk today a little bit about tests, specifically with focus on system tests. Um, I'm, I'm working at Red Hat today um, in a team called uh, Virtualization. We manage vi virtual machines when we also, t uh, we also work on containers and OpenShift and Kubernetes and all, all the great new stuff. <coughs> Overt, it's a system that manages the life cycle of VMs from, from deployment to running them and playing with them. And this is the origin of, uh, of my talk because I was, I'm developing in this team for around uh, three and a half years. And in the last few years, we focused a lot on system tests as a pre-step before we pass it to the test team, the QA. So we started writing a lot of system tests in our suit at, at the developer level. Um, this is how, how the Ovid system looks like. It, it's composed of uh, central management, a lot of hosts that are the hypervisors, which host the VMs. It has a uh, storage management and it has an API and an SDK which allow us to test it. So as you can see, it's a little bit complex. <coughs> so what we are going to discuss in this presentation, we are going to go briefly about the requirements of the, the test, of tests in general, and some best practices that we, I learned and as a team we learned from the system test that we wrote. What does it mean, beautiful code and tests, and how we can use PyTest for that? So test requirement, I'll go, I'll go over this very briefly. Of course, we need developers to write the automation tests. You better have good ones. Um, we need that, a target that is testable. So if you have like an, applica an application that is GUI-based, I will not consider this very testable. Although you can do tests with it, but you better have a good API or an SDK to, the, to your target. <coughs> you need tooling, which means you need uh, a framework that runs your test, a CI, some hardware or virtual machine that are prepared for you. You need it to be informative, which means you need it when it fails, when a test fails, you want, you want to understand what is the problem and you want to see the, the system fails please go ahead and look at the logs. You want something to, to give you tips of the problem. <laughs> As with regular code, you need to maintenance the tests and you need it to scale together with the target. And of course, you want it to run fast as much as possible. We all, always want fast. <coughs> so what are the, the best practices that we managed to learn from from working with Overt and the system test over Overt. By the way, I'm not going to discuss the, the CI and all this uh, ecosystem, which is very interesting, but I'm going to focus on writing, the writing of the test. <coughs> so, first rule that I learned in my youth um, was that we should first fail a test before we, we pass it. So, it, it means that if you write a test and you expect it to pass, you should first make sure that it fails first. Why? Because you may, may have checked something wrong, like uh, an always re uh, t return truth uh, solution and, and your test is just bad code. So if you don't want to have neg uh, false negative, you better make it fail first. You want to run the fast test first and only then the the slower ones because the fast the faster ones will will just allow you to run more tests in a smaller period of time and uh, if if something is wrong you will find it there very quickly and you will increase the feedback uh, you need the test to be focused it means that they need to 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 test one specific problem not or one specific scenario. It should not test many, many scenarios in one test because if it fails, you'll have to start debugging what exactly failed there, how, and look at the logs, and it'll take you a lot of time to do it. 
So if you can write the test very small, when, when it fails, it will tell you what's the problem. It's the best possible solution for you. Setup separation. Uh, it talks about separating between the, s the preparation for the test and the test itself. So you sometime for as an example, we may want to test that having a VM and you, you are able to create a new NIC device to attach a new NIC device to this VM. The creation of the VM is not of something that we are interested in testing. It's like it's a, the assumption that everything already works. So maybe someone already created the, the VM, uh, tested the VM creation before. At this test specifically, we just want to add the NIC. So it means that the setup is creation, creation of the NIC, maybe connecting to the, the management system, whatever is needed. And the test itself is just the attachment. And you want to separate it. If the test fails, then it's a failure. If the setup fails, it's an error. Um, expected failure. So I don't know. By the way, let's let's ask uh, who are here developers and who, who are your developers and who are testers. So it's like <laughs> I'm quick. Sorry. Who are who are the developers? And who is working here as testers? Great. So developers usually, at least from my experience, use a lot of time expected failure. So we have a bug, and we want, we want to express there is a bug in the system. So you write a test. We expect it to fail, which means we mark it as x fail. And then, then we hope in, in the future we or someone else will fix it. And then we can remove this expected failure. So in, in system testing, it's the same. You should write a test. If you find a bug, you should write it. You should mark it as expected failure. And then whenever someone will, will fix it, you can remove it. It also helps you, the tester help, helps them maybe write the test before the developers even wrote the implementation. So based on the specification of or the requirements. So they can write the test in a TDD mode and only later the development can implement it. It maybe fits Agile a little bit. Reusability of resources is about, if we talk before about setup, so if we have a VM, maybe we have multiple tests that require this VM. So if I can reuse the, te the VM for many tests, it's something that will make my tests faster. <laughs> Continue on failure. This is something that I found very interesting that um, from some reason there are some uh, people that run tests and they on the first test that they run, if, if the first failure that exists, the, they stop testing, continue testing. So this is not an optimal uh, solution. If, you, if, if a test fails, it only says that one specific problem exists in your system. So you, if you continue testing the rest of the test, continue running the suit, you may find some correlation with the other test that fail, or you can find that nothing else fails. So you can understand what is the state now. Interdependency or not having interdependencies. It's about not having interdependency bef between tests. Um, in unit tests, for example, it is very important not to have dependency between tests. But it's also true for a system test. If you want to have some dependency of resources between the tests, you can write setups and you can share setups. But try not to, to have dependency between the tests themselves. Uh, this is readability. This is uh, one of my pains as a reviewer. If you write code in general, it's, it's nice if the reviewer or someone else in the future, even you in the future, will read the code and will understand it without starting to find out what your algorithm is doing. So first of all, name everything correctly. Write, uh, try to describe how the, how, what the test is doing and not the how. And the how, hide it inside functions. Uh, dead test. So in production code, if we have dead test, uh, dead sorry, dead code, it means that we are either not running any test against it, or 
in, the, in, in its operation, it doesn't even run. No one calls it or something like that. With tests, it's harder. We don't have tests for tests. So the only way to, to make sure that the test is OK is that we run it. So if the test is not running at all, it may just rot. And, and the, syst the target that you are testing may change the API, and you won't even know it. So it, it's better to remove it if you can. If because you have a source code, or you can just revive it later if it's needed. <coughs> uh, randomization and logic. So try to avoid randomization and logic in test, in regular test. If you need randomization, which for example security issues, you should write your own separate suit that runs these tests. It's a special case, and it should not be related to the regular test that you are doing. And the reason for that is that. You, usually in test, it's it's very nice that you write an input and you say what you expect, so it, you can read it really nicely, and you know what's going on. If you do randomization, you don't really know what's going on. And logic is don't try to mimic the target logic and don't try to run after it. If you can remove as much as logic as you can from the test itself. <laughs> what does it mean, beautiful code? So first of all. Clarity and transparency. Clarity is how easy it's for you to read the code. And transparency is if the code tells you the names there, tells you that it does something, but actually it does something else, it's not a good, it's not a transparency. So if you call a name of a function in a specific way, you better do what it says and not do something else like surprising, like side effects is something bad. <laughs> Here is an, an example from just an attempt, my attempt to explain you what does it mean. This one, can you tell me what this one is testing? Do you know what this one does? It's the same, actually. Is it more, is it more clear now? So the name of the test is important, and how you write it inside of it is important. If you make it very complex, it will be hard to read it. Elegance is about uh, so solving one a problem in the same level of uh, complexity, but in d a little bit different ways. One it's a little bit nicer than the other. And a simple example is finding the max uh, value in, in a list of items. This is one way, and this is the simplest way in, in Python. Efficiency is about uh, algorithms and what you need for the interviews. So. Both can look really nice, like this one is really nice looking, but it's a little bit less efficient than this one. And you can check it later why. Uh, reusability and extendability. So you want to write your test, your code, whatever you have, you write. You want to t uh, write them in a way that you can reuse them in the future, either inside your project or outside, like you create a new project. So you want to reuse it, and you want to make allow it extendability. So you need interface. You need to make sure the dependency are correctly done, and not a mess of dependency. You want to make a modular and decouple code. Aesthetics for Python is pretty easy because we can use pep8 and just check our code and see that it goes with with the standard. It's how you look at how you format, for example, the dict or stuff like that. A small quiz until now. Let's see how uh, you, if you were listening well. As a reviewer, is it is this code good or bad? It's a simple enum, so no logic. Maybe, but it's not about uh, where's the prefix. It's not about the name. So yeah. the class name is uh, not uh, readable. Then upper state. So operational state, yeah, you can say that, but that's not the point I wanted to make. It's what? Hmm. Well, I look at it a little bit different. So if I see, I see it a lot, by the way, the attempt to, so someone that wrote something like this will say, why do I, I will ask him, why do you put everything inside the same, you have a general, uh, this constant spy uh, module, it's like uh, the garbage collector of your code. If you don't know where to put your constant, you'll put it here. 
and everyone in the in your project will probably import it. So if so, if I am going to add some some constants for the VMs or for the network, all, all the project will know about it, which is I don't. It's it's a, it's a dependency issue. So from my point of view, if the the VM stuff should go to the VM part in your program that manages it. And usually only the local ones will use it. And if someone from outside will need it, they will know that they need to contact the VM sub package or, pack or module to work with it. So try to distribute this and not create stars in your code. <laughs> this one, I hope it's a bit easier for you. Is this good or bad? Yeah, so there are a lot of things that are bad here, for example, First one is the name of the test. No one understands what it does. Like, okay, I'm testing the network, thank you. So it will fail. The failure of the network, the t the testing the network fail. Nice. So first of all, yes, you should create the networks outside. Why? Because you may want to reuse them to other tests. Like maybe one of the tests needs only network zero. All the rest need the, all of them. So you can reuse the objects. What? Now you assert the response. So if let's assume the ping uh, returns true or false. But uh, yes, you can say instead of a ping, you can say is connected to and then set net one. Um, <coughs> that's more or less what I had to say here. Yes, and that's a good one. There is no cleanup here. So if you if you have written the the create network as a setup, you will probably include their uh, teardown, which cleans up the network. And you can control when the network needs to be cleaned up there. So that's very good, thank you. A little bit of a pay test, this is a quick one, because I think there is, are more, more people will talk about it. So PyTest is the framework that runs testing. This is the most common one that exists today. It has fixtures, and this is like the, the star of PyTest, I think. Fixtures are setups and teardowns. Uh, it has intelligent asserts, which means that they are, they can interpret what is the object they are asserting on, and based on that, it will tell you uh, what's, like it will, for example, if they, there is a failure in the comparing uh, dicts, it will tell you, it will give you the output of the diff of these dicts. So it knows what it, it asserts, although you only write the assert. You have, it supports uh, expected failure and skips. It has a parameterized option. I will show it uh, in a few seconds. And it has plugins. And so these plugins, like everyone is writing these plugins, it has, if you, it's like the app store. You, you It has everything almost. And of course it has feature. Oh. So without feature, PyTest will not be PyTest. So it's important maybe to explain why. The classic way of setups usually is that you define a setup function and you, have, you define a teardown function and you put it in, in a module, in a class. <coughs> but but with, uh, with PyTest, you just define something that is called a feature. You decorate it, <coughs> as you can see here. So. Does any there is there someone here that doesn't know PyTest? Oh, that's good. <coughs> so the first one um, just decorates a function. It's per function. So if every test that depends on the first one will will do the setup, then at the yield point it, they will do what is written in the test, and then when the test finishes, it will execute the teardown. The second one is a module level scope which means that if you have multiple tests in, in your module, the first one that we run and depends on it, it will run the, the setup. And, and because it doesn't have here a teardown, you have a return and not a yield, it will, the other test in this module will just not run them. The third one is about, it's a session level, which means this is the, for, the first, for the whole test run of the test. Just an example. The, th the last one is an example of uh, using auto use, which means the test don't need to refer to it in order for it to run. They will just run for every test in general. Usually you can do that if you don't need uh, 
the output of it. So this is just the way how the how it looks like when you write the tests. Um, the intelligent asset is a simple asset, but you can use the same keyword to do the, all the asserts. Uh, X failing, you just mark it as an X fail. You can tell which uh, what is the exception that can cause it. If it's strict, it means that if it will pass, it will fail you, and you can write a reason. Parameterize is to input to have one test with multiple inputs. For each input, it will run a different set instance of the test. Uh, a little bit. Let's. This is a summary of what we had here as an example. So let's look at something ugly, very ugly. Um, <coughs> this is the <coughs> this is the ugly view, uh, test. <coughs> we the name is bad. The the body is, looks terrible. If you if you manage to understand it, it will be interesting. Please come to me after. We can talk about some work. Um, as you can see, the assert is here. So let's try to make it more readable. So first of all, we can create the the setups. So we can create a fixture for the connection and it's teared down. We can create the, the VM0 uh, fixture. So it will create the VM <coughs> and to destroy it in the end. We also have a fixture to run the, the VM and to stop it. And here there are two tests that can use it. The first one just just is dependent on the fixture of the VM that is not running. And the second one is about the fixture that is running. This is the second example, which is also a little bit ugly. You, this one is a setup with all the, um, all the objects inside of it. So you have the creating the network, the storage, the VM, two VMs actually running them, and then reporting back with the dict. It, it is preferable to do something like that, to say, to give each of them uh, a picture, and then in the test, just collect them all and say what you need there. So other picture can use everything or only partial, partial stuff. Thank you.